We thank you for um, the sounds of birds and all of the many and daily reminders of your goodness and your grace and your love for us. We thank you for making us in your image, and for enabling us to be stewards of this world that you've created. And we pray your blessing upon the events of this day and this hour. We thank you for this board. We thank you for the stewardship that has been entrusted to them. And we pray that you would give understanding, that you would give uh, wisdom, that you would give humility, that you would give uh, discernment, and that you would guide them as they make decisions for our great county. We thank you for the opportunity to, to live here, to enjoy the freedoms that we have, to enjoy the blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, we pray that you would watch over our every move, our every step, and our every word today. And may we do all in fear of your holy and beautiful name. And we pray all of this in that holy and beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Officer Cott. So, we're going to uh, go right into public comment this morning. So, uh, Bill, how many speakers do we have? There are six signed up. Um, the first one is Julie Carrick. Okay. So, if you would just come to the, uh, to the dais here, let us know who you are and where you live, and we're looking forward to your comments. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Julie Carrick. Um, I am a resident of Providence in Mapleton, Georgia, which is exactly right across the street from um, the Henderson Park Proposal Master Plan. And I also am a board member of um, Mapleton Improvement Coalition. And I would just like to say I hope today as you look over the plans to approve that you do I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> I'm not very good at speaking in That's public, all right. Take so your time. I apologize. No um, I just like to say, um, in regards to the Mapleton Improvement Coalition, we hope that you do approve this plan, and we appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Your next public speaker is um, Jocelyn Bedador. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not the first person to butcher that name. So, <laughs> so good morning. I'm Jacqueline Bettadapur. I'm chair of the Cobb County Democratic Committee. And I'd like to address uh, this morning with you the administration of upcoming elections in Cobb County. I live in District 2, by the way. Um, on October 19th, 2018, a New York Times report was filed from Marietta, Georgia, with the headline, Georgia Voting begins amid accusations of voter suppression. It opens with the voting story of Wim Laven, a professor at Kennesaw State University, who, quote, arrived to his polling location in Atlanta's northern suburbs this week, unsure of what to make of recent allegations of voter difficulties at the ballot box. Then he waited for two hours in the Georgia sun, <coughs> saw one person in the line treated for heat exhaustion, and watched a second collapse, receive help from paramedics, yet refused to be taken to the hospital so he could remain in line and cast his ballot. Mr. Laven stated, I have a hard time imagining this is anything but an intentional effort. I can't imagine this is just pure incompetence. Everyone knew how serious people have been around here about getting out the vote. A photo of voter lines at Whitlock Central Office headlined the article. Cobb County became the poster child for long voter lines and allegations of voter suppression. So what are we going to do to prevent this from happening again? Election year 2020 is projected to have unprecedented turnout. There are significant increases in voter registrations. On top of all that, we are rolling out new voting systems. 
limited in-person early voting access, more about that in a minute, and now precinct changes are before you for approval this morning. Short notice, just under the wire, precinct changes that will impact 43,258 voters two months before a major election. This has the makings of a perfect storm. I'd like to thank the Cobb Board of Elections for offering numerous early voting locations and a second Saturday option that is over and above what the law requires. The first two weeks of early voting, however, are only available through the Whitlock Central Office and the Senior Wellness Center located just three miles south of the Whitlock Central Office. These two locations may be centrally located in this very large county, but are far too far away from most Cobb voters to be realistically available. If you map out distance from Ackworth, East Cobb, Kennesaw, Ostell, Powder Springs, on average you're looking at 10 to 15 miles. It's 13 miles for me. It took me 30 minutes to get here this morning. I won't be voting in the first two weeks of early voting, driving all the way out here to submit a vote. So most Cobb voters are not going to do that. They're going to wait till the satellites open in the third week, or they're going to wait till election day when they can just go to their local precinct. So in reality, Cobb early in-person voting is only available for one week to most voters. So although, although we're meeting the letter of the law mandating three weeks, I question whether we're meeting the intent of the law, which is to make early voting accessible to all Cobb voters. We saw this same pattern during the municipal elections last year. Two weeks of early voting were only available at Whitlock. Do you think a person in Kennesaw, where they had municipal elections, drives down to Whitlock to early vote? No, the voting numbers show that that did not happen. So in the first two weeks total, 145 votes were cast at that Whitlock office. The first day of the third week, when the satellites opened up, you had 357 votes cast more than were cast in the first two weeks at the Whitlock Center. For the whole third week of in-person early voting, 1,959 votes were cast. Of those, only 52 were cast at the Whitlock office. And now precinct changes, impacting more than 43,000 voters at this late date, just under the wire. Precinct changes with short notice lead up, leading up to major elections cause voter confusion and disruptions. These are before you today for approval. I attend the Cobb Board of Elections meetings regularly. We have an appointed board member to represent our interests, and yet none of us were aware that these changes were planned. The lack of transparency, lack of communication, and the timing on all this is very concerning. Three Smyrna precincts. Smyrna, where we just saw a razor-thin margin of victory for Derek, Norton, uh, for Derek Norton in the Smyrna mayor's race. Why Smyrna? Why now? Dobbins 01 precinct to be split in two, um, because according to statements made yesterday at the Board of Elections meeting, we have to increase the number of precincts. Well, in 2018, Dobbins 01 had boundary changes because at that point in time, we needed to reduce the number of precincts. So it was part of a scheme of taking five precincts and reducing them to three. So here we have Dobbins 01, which is quite frankly the poor stepchild of Cobb precincts. It's extremely fragmented geographically, composed of vulnerable voting populations. I ask you, who lives in neighborhoods bordering Dobbins Air Base? There are five district combos in Dobbins 01. And on top of that mess, we're going to add two precinct changes in two years. Dobbins 01 delivered returns to Stacey Abrams of 79.3% in 2018. So I reiterate, these changes but leading up to major elections cause voter confusion and disruption. These are before you today. Projected unprecedented turnout, rolling out new voting systems, limiting early vote access, and now short notice precinct changes. Again, this has the makings of a perfect storm. What will the New York Times headline read in 2020? There will be heightened secure scrutiny this year. Voters are not confident that our elections are fair, secure, and administered impartially and equitably. And I remind you, the impact of your decisions is what matters, not okay. the intent. You will I'm be sorry, judged I'm, by the impact, not the intent. Ma'am, I'm sorry, intent. your time has expired. Okay. Thank you. I just want to get a little extra time. Sarah Tyndall Guars. Sorry. Well, just relax. Let's... 
gazelle like the deer. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sarah Tyndall Gazelle, and I'm a re resident of Cobb County. I come to you today to speak very briefly on the cityhood efforts in East Cobb, as that would affect me personally as a resident of East Cobb. I am grateful that the proponents of this have decided to hold off during this legislative session. It gives time for everyone to study these issues much more carefully. I would direct your attention to a study that has been performed by the University of Georgia in cooperation with DeKalb County and the DeKalb County Legislative Delegation. They commissioned a study to understand the overall impact of cityhood efforts in DeKalb County of, for the, the county itself to see how these cityhood efforts would impact the county's ability to deliver the services that they need. This was done via local legislation through the legislative, count, legislative delegation in cooperation with the county commission. I strongly encourage you to reach out to the state delegation and to conduct a similar study with the University of Georgia. I submit that it would be highly irresponsible to move forward with any cityhood efforts throughout the county without understanding what the impact would be on the county's ability to deliver the services that it does. We live, I live in Cobb County because it is the best run county in the state. I want to see that to continue. I think everybody here would agree that Cobb is outstanding in its delivery of services, but we cannot move forward with efforts that would remove the ability from the county to deliver the services that, that our citizens deserve. I thank you very much for your time and your attention. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Caroline Holka. Hi, good morning. My name is Caroline Holko. I'm a resident of District 3. Um, and I am here to talk about the proposed precinct changes in Cobb County. I don't have enough for everybody, but I'll be happy to leave this. This is the agenda from the Board of Elections meeting yesterday. I just want you to notice how thick this is and imagine that you're not a commissioner or you're not connected to all of these meetings in your community and you go, oh, I'm going to go check this out and this is what you're presented with. We have a lot of changes coming up in the way the state handles elections. We're getting new voting machines. We're not even having our presidential preference primary on its usual day. We're not part of Super Tuesday anymore because of all these changes. So while the proposed changes do in fact meet the letter of the law, I'm also echoing that I don't think they meet the spirit of the law. And I have some serious concerns about whether or not our elect our board of elections is going to have the staff to appropriately and efficiently run these additional precincts and because in the board of elections yesterday when they voted on the changes they elected to approve them as one block instead of individually so even though some of the splits like bells ferry 03 which is a massive precinct with multiple house districts in it so there's multiple ballots I just think it's too close to the election. I'm concerned about, and furthermore, are we even going to have enough equipment? Because Janine Eveler was very frank about the fact that our Board of Elections is still waiting for equipment. The presidential primary is on March 24th. That's gonna go by like that. So are we gonna have enough equipment to staff these additional precincts? What steps are we going to take to notify voters of their precinct changes? Because, you know, the precinct registration card actually looks like a car warranty scam that's been going around. I don't know about you, but I get calls about my car warranty on the daily. I don't have a warranty on my car. <laughs> so there's a lot of moving parts going around, and I'm just concerned that I don't feel I haven't seen a real plan for making sure that voters understand that their precinct has moved and why. I don't know how we're going to staff these additional locations. And we already struggle to staff sufficient early voting locations. So how is adding extra precincts going to serve the voters of Cobb County? Mm -hmm. And again, I want to point out that um, our county officials, Janine Eveler is amazing. She was she gave a fantastic presentation that explained why she feels these changes are necessary and to the benefit of Cobb citizens. 
And she's not 100% wrong. I don't question that we need to make some of these changes. I question whether or not we need to do it now, if that's the most appropriate use of our time, when what we should be doing is training our election staff on the new machines and making sure that we have adequate equipment for every single precinct. And I doubt that right now. There's a lot of things that have not been delivered. It's appalling. So I hope that the commission will take steps to protect the voters of Cobb County. And I have faith that Cobb County will continue to be a leader. I would like to end up in the New York Times this election cycle as a shining example, not a warning. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ben Williams. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Dr. Williams. Commission and staff. First of all, Happy New Year. Um, I want to bring to your attention not a new item, but an old item uh, from last year. There was scheduled a meeting with the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority, I believe in October. And because of the unavailability of the chairman, that meeting uh, was not held. So I simply uh, have a question. Has that meeting been rescheduled and announced? If so, <clears throat> uh, when is that? And if that is not the case, I would respectfully ask the board uh, to put that meeting back on its agenda. Many of us was looking uh, at that meeting as being a first opportunity to at least uh, part to hear, participate in some of the expected uh, conversations between the board of the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority and our board of commissioners. Uh, folk uh, have been asking me, why do I continue to come uh, to you with my concerns about the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority. Uh, and I have to remind them that I do so because this board, my board, our board, is a designated appointing authority and consequently has responsibility for its appointees. So that's why I continue to come and and increasing conversations with the other authority, uh, that is the legislative delegation that has a footprint uh, in uh, the redevelopment authorities area. So if the meeting has not been rescheduled, uh, sir, I would respectfully ask that that meeting does get back on your agenda. And of course, as always, uh, announce it uh, so that uh, those of us who have expressed interest uh, can be here. Thank you so much. And remember, have a good new year. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, Lance Lamberton. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the uh, board. Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Lance Lamberton. I'm a living hostel. Georgia, and I'm chairman of the Cobb Taxpayers Association. The reason I'm coming for you, before you today is to talk about the flex bus system. Uh, around early part of last year, I got together, me and Jim Mastuda, who's the vice chairman of our organization, we met with Gary Myers, and we talked about replacing flex with a rider share service, which would be more efficient and would cover a larger area, would be more responsive to the needs of the community. And he told me at the time that they're looking at putting that replacing flex perhaps late summer of last year. Now that didn't happen. I since have talked to Mr. Myers and there's been a delay or it seems like your legal department took a very long time in finally getting back 
uh, to us to deal with the issues of liability and replacing Flex with uh, uh, with the rider share services. Uh, I, I've heard that since that time, the legal department has gotten back to, uh, uh, to the transportation department, but I don't know what the content or, or the substance of what the legal department came up with. So I'm coming to you mostly to ask that you dispatch or work, work to get this uh, report and any issues of liability resolved because I think it's something that's needed and necessary uh, in this county to replace Flex. But by the way, Flex is an incredibly wasteful program which should be discontinued. There's as much as $50 per rider subsidy. I've tried to get information for the last couple of weeks as to how much money the county and taxpayers have spent supporting Flex. Um, I've had to think that since it's been around since 2015, it might be in the millions of dollars, considering the amount of subsidy. And every time I see those albatrosses lumbering through South Cobb, I see red, as in red ink. Um, I don't know what possessed the, the board to ever allow Flex to come to existence in the first place. Uh, I don't think any thought was given to a cost versus benefit analysis. It's when taxpayers see our money being wasted in this manner that there is a breach of trust between us and, our, and the elected leaders. Um, you know, if there's that kind of waste going on with Flex, then where else is there waste? There has to be waste somewhere else. We as taxpayers do have the right to have the efficient delivery of services to the taxpayer. And in this instance, it's not happening. And so I ask you to, with all dispatch, to move forward on replacing Flex with a cost-effective service that will do a better job of providing transportation needs in South Cobb. Thank you. Yeah, Lance, uh, I asked uh, um, Erica Parrish about that um, earlier this week, and she assured me that the RFP for that alternative service yes, sir. is very close to being put out on the street, and okay. I asked her to move that along as quickly as possible. So well, that, that's really good news. And uh, you know, I was going to say I came before you about three months ago, and I got such a pleasant reception from you that I'm thinking I might want to do this more often. <laughs> You're always welcome, Lance. This <laughs> Be is careful your house. what you ask for. <laughs> right. Thank you. Always a pleasure to see you, Lance. <laughs> Chairman, that's all that's on the list. Since we started public comment, there was one other person that sure. signed up. I think I think the uh, policy allows us to do that, right? As long as they sign up during the during the meeting and it doesn't exceed 12. Co correct. If that's what the board okay, wants so, to do, or so let's. Sheila up. Edwards. Thank you for your indulgence, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Chairman Boyce and members of the Board of Commissions. My name is Sheila Edwards, and I reside in the Mableton community of South Cobb and Legacy at the Riverline. <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice. I'm on the back end of um, bronchitis, but um, I wanted to be here with you this morning. Um, before I begin, I want to wish you and your families a happy, healthy, and prosperous 2020. As everyone prepares their wish list for the year, our community has a few items on its wish list, which I would like to share with you. At the top of the list is the development of Magnolia Crossing, and I join my a compadre here, Dr. Ben, and saying that that parcel needs to be addressed. To, uh, Magnolia Crossing is a 50-acre site of community that has been dormant for over five years while the surrounding community suffers from food and bank deserts and other necessities. What we cannot support and what you should not support or condone is the South Cobb Redevelopment Authority allowing another year to go by with no action on, that part, on their part to secure that objective, objective of developing this parcel of land. As we wait for the anticipation and in anticipation to receive the latest 40 case study on Magnolia Crossing, I urge you and the Development Authority to consider creating a public-private partnership with incentives to develop this prime real estate once and for all. We remain um, interested in this parcel and we urge you to act accordingly. Our communities support smart, forward-thinking development of Magnolia Crossing as well as other areas of South Cobb. And one area in particular I want to point to you is the Kmart um, shopping plaza at the corner of Veterans and, and Mableton Parkway. I came before you last year or the year before and asked about looking at that property and putting something there 
because Kmart was closing. Now it serves as a, um, a parking lot for Amazon trucks. There's a way to turn that situation into something positive for our community, and I urge you to look at creating a community center there where we can have veterans, um, a community center for children, and a community center for our seniors. That's the best use of that property, not for the Amazon trucks. Um, I also want to talk about tra the transportation plan and want to ensure that it's inclusive of South Cobb, which includes resurfacing of roads, the installation of sidewalks, and the placement of street lights. I fully support the T-spots, but I want to ensure that there are equitable projects in our community that are included on a set project list, as Commissioner Grant Gambrell stated, and that once approved, these projects don't mysteriously fall off the list or it's placed at the end of the line for consideration. I also want to talk about affordable housing in our community, not just in South Cobb, but all of Cobb. I remain concerned about the vote taken last year not to approve the senior affordable housing project. We must do better. I've called for an affordable housing summit and I began talking with stakeholders about this. It is much needed and I hope it is pursued. Naming of Discovery Park. I struggle to understand the continued delays associated with the Park and Discovery Boulevard near my home of Legacy on the Riverline. The park, which remains nameless, should reflect inclusion and a diverse residence and families that call this area home. So I urge you to reject the vision and champion diversity. Though some people insist on naming every blade of grass in our community after the Confederacy, please remember the divisiveness of the Civil War, which, fought, which was fought over slavery, which is reflective of a dark and painful history period in our history for everyone who looks like me. I have visited Riverline Park, which is just down the street from my home, and have stepped off the trail to read the various markings honoring the Confederate soldiers and where they fought. I also read the footnotes on how these were built. Slaves were forced to toil in the scorching summer heat, with many succumbing to blistering, its blistering intensity to build these for the people who wanted to keep them enslaved. What can people who look like me celebrate or honor here? After reading those markers, I never want to visit that spot again or read that history again. And I will never take anyone who comes to, my, comes to visit me to see that because I'm not proud of that. So I urge you to choose inclusion instead of division. If preservationists want you to pay homage to a history, let's name the park after the original citizens, the American Indians. In closing, our community is great and is poised for even more greatness. Our concerns regarding our community will not go away. They are only intensifying. We continue to urge the Board of Commission to ex exercise oversight and control that you have to ensure that citizens of, our, of the South Cobb community are receiving the deliverables similar to other communities in Cobb and that promises made to us are promises that are kept. And I would like to take my last few seconds to speak about an event that's coming up next month, Chairman. It is the... I'm, um, I'm sorry your time is up, Ms. Edwards. Uh, well, it's, it's a project that you're, you're championing. Mm -hmm. no, no. All right, but I was, you all know why, you all know. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you for your consideration. Um, we're presently working on an expungement and reentry program for returning citizens. This is something that um, District Attorney um, Holmes and the solicitor and the chairman are our champion. Um, it's important for us to support this because, as you know, um, returning citizens don't always have an opportunity to find a job, and if they're not able to find a job to support their families, they end up becoming um, returning criminals, and they end up breaking into our homes and our businesses. So we're having an event um, at on February 29th at the Epi Center in um, District 4, and we are urging support of this from businesses and other entities that want to help support these um, individuals in returning back to our communities and being effective citizens. Thank you. Chairman, that concludes the speakers. Okay, let's go to the consent agenda, and I'll let... Uh, We'll scroll down to the consent agenda items and let everybody know that items 23 and 24 have been withdrawn from the consent agenda. I'm sorry. All right. Not my notes, but... The, um, the, the change in the uh, funding... 
part, it talked about that the this was about the sale of property, the hundred and fifty thousand. Right. And in the item, it says it was going to the DOT tip. Right. Um, that's not allowed. Right. It has to go to the two thousand five SPLOS. Okay. And so the change is just where the money's going to. So we're going to redirect it to two thousand five SPLOS. Right. Okay. Um, which is what we did. We you know we had to correct that. Right. Yeah. So that's that was a change. Okay. I'd like to pull items 13, 14, and 15 for discussion. The precinct changes. Well, I think we need a motion on that. No, you, one commissioner can pull an agenda item. I'll second. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. Now the question is, what is the impact of how long do you want to pull it for? Well, I, you, it's just being pulled for discussion. It's being pulled for discussion it's being during moved the current the regular agenda. You're going to put it on the regular agenda? That's what you want to do? Yes, Chairman. Oh, okay. All right. That's fine. I thought you were pulling it entirely from the agenda from today. You want to talk? You want to move it to regular? That's what I want to hear, if, right? If we did that, that would be part of the discussion, but I'm pulling it from consent. Okay. So you want to move it to regular? Is that your intent, Commissioner Keeper? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So uh, call the motion. Passes five to zero. So we'll move uh, we'll move those three items to regular. All right. Any other discussion? No, that's already, that's already been passed. On any other discuss in, on the consent agenda. Okay, without a call of question. Passes five to zero. As revised, right. All right, on to a regular agenda. So when we go, we'll start with transportation. Since you're already at the podium, Ms. Parrish. Good morning. We have nine items for consideration this morning. The first item is requesting um, that the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with C.W. Matthews Contracting Company, Inc. and a savings to the project in the amount of $29,589.42 for Interstate North Parkway Roadway re Restoration. Commissioner Ott. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to zero. Okay, thank you, sir. Our next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Baldwin Paving Company, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $367,297.87 for the bridge replacement on Macedonia Road over Noses Creek. Commissioner Cupid. Yes, thank you for the email yesterday. Yes, ma'am. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes okay. 5 to 0. Thank you, sir. Our next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Paulette Tucker Enterprises, Inc., DBA, Tucker Grading and Hauling, the savings to the project in the amount of $15,831.25 for phase three demolition of two condominiums located at Forest Ridge Condominiums for construction of Windy Hill Road, Terrell Mill Road Connector. Commissioner Ott. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Okay. Thank you, sir. The next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners determine that circumstances are such that it is necessary to proceed with condemnation proceedings by declaration of taking under OCGA 32-3-4, authorize the commencement of condemnation proceedings on one parcel on Factory Shoals Road at Harmony Leland and Clay Elementary Schools Phase 2 project. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to Thank you. The next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve a memorandum of agreement with the Cobb County Marietta Water Authority in an amount not to exceed $1,475,000 for the relocation of water line facilities for Kennesaw Mountain pedestrian improvements. Uh, Commissioner Gambrell. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Pass the 5 to 0. Okay, thank you. Our next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with Georgia Bridge and Concrete LLC in an amount not to exceed $631,685.64 for bridge replacement on Powers, Powers Ferry Drive at, over Rottenwood Creek Tributary. Commissioner Ott. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. to zero. Okay, thank you. 
Our next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve project number X2262 to the 2018 countywide unit price contract with Chatfield Contracting Inc. in an amount not to exceed $24,455 for drainage system repairs on Anderson Farm Road at Powder Springs Road. Mr. Cupid. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Okay, thank you. Our next item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one to resurfacing contract 2019-2 Local Road South with Bartow Paving Company, a no-cost time extension through June 30th, 2020 for resurfacing of county-maintained streets. Mr. Cupid. Yes. Layla Drive. That'll that'll be considered for the next cycle. This was last okay. year's 2019. It's okay. just a time extension on the existing contract. Okay, thank you. Yes, so moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes. Push forward. Mm -hmm. Pat five to zero. Okay, thank you. The last item is requesting that the Board of Commissioners approve change order number two final with the contract with Glosson Enterprises LLC, a savings to the project in the in the amount of forty seven thousand five hundred and sixty eight dollars and ninety seven cents for Nichols Road sidewalks. Commissioner Gamble. So moved. Second. Discussion. Call the question. Passes five to zero. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Erica. All right, on to uh, public services. First, start with parks. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. Manager. Uh, we have two items for you this morning. Uh, the first is uh, to look at the master plan for the Camp Family Park, and then the second item will be for the Henderson Road property. Uh, this, these are the, the fourth and the fifth uh, master plans for the properties. Uh, once we go through these today, we'll have one left uh, the, the per property. Uh, just like in the, the, the first three, we had a very um, exhaustive process that we went through with the public, uh, going through two public input meetings, uh, having it presented to the Recreation Board, uh, and gathering very good input. Uh, you will notice, though, that uh, the theme is carrying on of uh, passive trails, uh, picnic shelters uh, at, at each of these parks. So we'll start off with the Kemp Family Park. This piece of property is located in West Cobb in, in District 1 on Burnt Hickory Road. Uh, if you go this way on Burnt Hickory Road, you, go, you come down to Ackworth due west. If you go this way on Burnt Hickory, you come down to the intersection of Old Mountain Road and Burnt Hickory. Uh, Dominion Christian High, uh, School is here, and Harrison High School sits right here. So we have two uh, schools that border us on this piece of property. This, is, th this was the residence of uh, Tommy Kemp. Uh, we've had a couple of, of uh, on-site meetings, so I'm sure you all know where, where Mr. Kemp uh, lived here on the property. But we're looking at the main road uh, coming in just like the, the, uh, the uh, cart path road is now. Uh, coming down to a uh, parking lot, uh, one of the things that we heard in the in the public input meetings is we wanted, or they 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 wanted us to get the parking over the hill enough to where you weren't just staring at a at a at a parking lot, but it also maintained the view of Lost Mountain, which sits over in this area. So we we feel like we we've, we've been able to do that. Uh, the the Kemp residents, we feel like the. The best uh, use of that right now would be some type of a caretaker uh, house, because uh, this is going to be just a open piece of property for several years and, uh, until it's developed. Uh, so having a, having a caretaker on the on the property would be very beneficial. Uh, trail network: uh, the darker trails that you see here are like slate, uh, more natural trails, and then the tan colored trails that you see here are actually concrete. Uh, one of the things that the consultant did factor in is that in the future trail master plan that DOT has, uh, there, there is a trail connecting all the way up to Alatoona, uh, Lake Alatoona. So that would be future uh, if and when DOT started that project. Uh, this corner here is in a life estate that was done through the, through the sale of the property. Uh, so. The, the gentleman that lives here now will, will stay here. We will not have access to it until this gentleman passes, and then it will become part of the overall park. Uh, we, we've got slate trails, natural trails that, that go up through the wooded area. There are some civil war earthworks up in this area, which will be addressed with 
uh, interpretive signage. Uh, you'll see a medley of large group shelters, small group shelters, medium group shelters uh, put throughout the property. Uh, the, the, the fence line here, we propose to keep it intact. Um, and then you'll see right here uh, that the, the um, Altoona Creek actually traverses the western portion of the property. So uh, passive, uh, there's nothing to say that a group of kids can't go out and play touch football here or they can fly a kite there. They can, you know, just use open meadows for any type of an activity that will be done, but there will be no organized uh, sports uh, here on this property. So any questions? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. So, um, Cheryl Gamble, this is yours. Okay, motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Call the question. I have a comment. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, I just, I previously stated my concern about the master plans, and um, I'm just not going to restate them here. So, although I think it's a great plan, I just can't support it. Okay, all right. So, I still call the question. It passes four to one. The commissioner out in opposition. The second item uh, is for uh, a piece of property that we purchased on Henderson Road. Uh, it's 29.3 acres. If you go Veterans Memorial Highway this uh, to the right, you'll eventually get to 285. Uh, if you go it to the left, uh, you'll eventually get to Floyd Road um, to the west. Uh, this property was acquired in phases. Uh, we were able to acquire some of the property through the, through the governor's green space program years ago, uh, but we were able to finish out the purchase of, of this property with the 2008 parks bond program. And when we started this uh, public input process, we had two very, two very distinct uh, groups of people in the crowd. We, had, we have Civil War Earthworks, uh, so of course we, have, we had the preservationist. Uh, but we also had community-minded folks that said, we want a place to be able to take our kids uh, to, to recreate. So balance was the key word for this piece of property. Uh, this circle, this, is, this kind of blows it up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, there, there would be one entrance into the parking lot and then one exit. Uh, Henderson Road is already built there. It already has a, a good asphalt base. And, and it all, we already have culverts uh, under that uh, road there. So the consultant thought it, it would be excellent because of this curve to separate the entrance and the exit. Of course, whenever we do get into construction mode or planning mode, uh, DOT would have the final say so on how we would do that. Uh, but coming into the, into the parking lot here, uh, you've got an educational plaza where we would have some interpretive signage there letting folks know uh, about the earthworks, there's an old uh, grist mill uh, back here at 16, just talking about what was done on this property back in the day. Uh, we've got an interactive fountain, so children can go up there and splash around on a, on a, uh, on a, on a spray playground there, and then a natural playground uh, here in this area. Uh, an open area here that, where they can run, play, uh, throw a frisbee, uh, fly a kite, You've got a paved trail here in this area uh, that we could even possibly do the rubberized walking surface like we've done at several of the parks to make it easier on the seniors. But you've got just a, a nice little walking trail here. Um, and then crossing over, this is a, uh, the existing detention pond at the Publix next door, but it overflows down to this area. So one thing we're, we're proposing is to create like a aquatic educational uh, area right there. So we would dig it out a little bit, have reeds uh, growing in it uh, to where we can do some outdoor education. One of the neatest things we, we feel like on this, on this project is this number six. That's an educational flex building. We kept hearing we need a, a place for like small family reunions. Uh, but then some folks said, no, we need a pavilion. So what we're proposing on this, pro on this, on this park is having a flex building to where you've got garage doors that can, you can close them down and you can have a nice little uh, uh, family reunion, class reunion, but if you want a, a uh, picnic pavilion, you raise up the garage doors 
So it can be indoor or outdoor. Uh, it would be heated and cooled if the doors are downed, uh, and then uh, it would not. So that's a neat concept uh, now with the, with the flex building. The trails, once you leave this area down here, would all be natural. Um, getting up into the, uh, where the grist mill is, where the earthworks are, there's about three, three or four of them in this area. Uh, the actual Henderson Road, it would be gated here only for e emergency or maintenance big vehicle access, getting back into the area. Um, another neat concept of this plan is this number 18. Uh, Nickajack Creek flows through here and having, having an overlook where you're looking down on the creek, uh, will, because this is all county land here as well, uh, will be a nice addition to the park. So, any questions? Seeing no, Commissioner Cupid. Yes, just thank you um, to park staff and um, all involved for balancing the many diverse perspectives and what yeah. should occur here. With that um, move that we approve this agenda item. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes four to one with Commissioner Odd in opposition. Thank you. Okay, on the information services. Sorry? Oh, okay, I was going to do that after we done all the, yes, okay. but we can do it now if you want. I mean, I hadn't forgotten about it. All right, Sharon, go ahead, since you're already here. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. Um, the agenda item I have this morning is a joint item between Information Services and the um, um, Chief Medical Examiner for the county. On August 8, 2017, the Board of Commissioners approved an agreement with VertiQ Software LLC in an amount not to exceed $196,070 to implement a medical examiner case management system. After working with the medical examiner, we determined that additional customizations of the software are required by VertiQ. These additional customizations will provide greater efficiencies, additional analysis, and will able, enable the medical examiner's office to meet the business needs and recording requirements of the National Association of Medical Examiners required for name accreditation. The additional customizations require an increase in the original contract of $61,445. The medical examiner case management system is an eligible project program under the 2016 SPLOST Support Services Technology Improvement Work Program. We request that the Board of Commissioners Approved change order number one with VertiQ Software LLC in an amount not to exceed $61,445 for the Cobb County Medical Examiner's Office's case management system, authorize the corresponding budget transactions, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Um, this will not increase the operation, operating annual cost. So there's no impact there. Commissioner Ott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know, I know everyone remembers that part of the reason we have a medical examiner uh, in-house now is that there was um, an effort by the board to improve um, the whole operation there. And, and one of the things that the board directed was for the medical examiner to work towards name certification, which is basically the National Association of Medical Examiner Certification. Um, so these requested changes are part of that getting to that level to be able to have a certified medical examiner. So motion to approve. Okay. Discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. Have a seat, Scott. We're gonna do the uh we're gonna do the um uh the precinct issue right now. So that is Janine here. Okay. And for those who uh are watching from home, we'll be looking at 13, 14, and 15. Right. And these are, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read those again just to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about first, okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. The first um, agenda item was to authorize the division of Dobbins 01 precinct in order to form Dobbins 02 precinct. The second agenda item was to authorize the division of Bells Ferry 03 precinct in order to form the Bells Ferry 04 precinct. And the fifth one was to authorize Division of Smyrna 3 Alpha Precinct in order to form the Smyrna 3 Bravo Precinct. Okay, with that, we have the floor. Thank you. Um, we have several precincts that are quite large, and we have been looking at dividing those so that 
especially with the new system coming in, we can serve a smaller number of voters at each of the facilities. Uh, these three were on our plate to divide uh, earlier in 2019, uh, but one being in Smyrna and Smyrna having a runoff in December, it bumped us down here to the January meeting. Uh, so what we're looking at is we now have over uh, half a million active registered voters in Cobb. And we, in the past, had been reducing the number of precincts because of efficiencies and the existing system was running smoothly and so we were able to reduce some precincts in the past. We're now at a point where our number of voters and with the new system coming in, it is advisable, it's what I would advise, that we begin to grow the number of precincts that we have. And um, it is going to be a challenge, as some of uh, the public has stated, to staff all of the polling locations. Um, but I think it's necessary to make smaller groups at the polling locations on Election Day. Uh, as far as advanced voting, we are hoping that we will bleed off some of the voters in that uh, part of the voting because we are offering more hours of advanced voting in this um, upcoming March election than we have ever done in a presidential primary. So we understand the issues about offering more voting opportunities. And um, this is, unfortunately, it is, the timing is close to the election, but we believe it is a preventative measure to um, reduce the number of people at the polling locations. All right, uh, Commissioner uh, Burrell. Uh, Janine, what of these three changes or three precinct changes, what is a result of the schools no longer allowing us to have voting um, precincts in the schools and we had to find other locations such as the churches and, and facilities, Windy Hill? And um, that would be sort of a separate issue. That was um, something that we have been doing all of last year and we made a commitment to do that at the end of 2018 when we were seeing in the governor's election that we had a lot of issues getting voters access into some of the school polling locations because you know their main priority is to secure their facility for the children. And so it kind of is a cross purpose for us where we are trying to make it as accessible as possible. Um, so uh, we were seeing that it was becoming more and more of an issue um, and required more uh, deputy sheriffs to secure and make them feel comfortable that it was a secure place. So we made a commitment last in end of 2018 to, to move out of the schools. We've done about half of them. Um, we, we started out with about 60 school polling locations and um, with the ones that were approved by the board yesterday that puts us about halfway done. And we won't do any more of those this year in the election year, but we will continue doing that in 2021. Okay. But were any of these splits in schools originally or currently? They, they are not in schools. These three um, are split. So what that means is we'll continue to use the polling facility that they're currently in. Um, and that these three are the ones that we could easily find a second polling location within the precinct boundaries. So we are just dividing it and splitting the people into two different facilities within that same precinct footprint. Okay. Um, the, most of y'all know the Bells Ferry Civic Association. They're very involved, not just in zoning, but in all county issues. So when I got the map for the Bell's Ferry split for three and four, I sent the map and the agenda item to them to help get the word out as well. And they are helping with social media next door and, and their um, email list and websites too to get the word out in the Bell's Ferry area. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know of other groups that are in that we may could reach out to like that, um, as well as other organizations that could help 
us get the word out of the change? Uh, we will be having a communication uh, effort to get uh, that word out, not just about these three, but all of what we've done uh, since the last election. So uh, there have been many precinct changes, and we're going to, um, well, these people will get a precinct card, which I, I understand, you know, the issue with the card being small. Um, these locations will, because we're so close to the election, we're going to send a first-class letter to their registered address as well so that they'll get a special notification that we wouldn't normally do for any kind of precinct activity. We also um, put up signage at the old location. If in, these, in this case there isn't an old one, but as you mentioned, the uh, closures of some of the schools, so we would have signs at those locations saying you now vote at and then the, the new location. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll also work with Ross with some social media uh, communication plan. We um, have yet to talk about exactly how we're going to do that, but we plan to have, you know, a, a press release and, and some information. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Rod. Um, Janine, two of the things that we heard about was um, long lines. So part of the whole reason you're doing this is to reduce the lines yes. because you're dividing up a precinct into two so that people won't have to wait in line as long. Um, and the other thing is, you know, someone could say, oh, well, you know, now somebody comes to 3A who has to go to 3B. Well, it's still in the same precinct footprint. It's just adding a second location. So it's not like somebody's going to have to drive clear across the county or clear across the city of Smyrna to get to those locations, correct? That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I pulled it. Sure, yeah. Yes, thank just, you. I, I don't wondering. understand why I didn't get a chance to address my yeah. oh, reason I'm, why I'm, I pulled I'm, it. I'm, I'm going down, down the board here. So. Oh, okay. I didn't hear my name called. Well, I'm just, I was looking down here. Okay. And, so, Commissioner Cupid, you have okay. the floor. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, I'm hearing that the premise for these agenda items has to do with these being large precincts. Has there ever been complaint at these precincts? We get complaints at all of our precincts <laughs> for <laughs> various things. I, I, okay, let me be more specific yes. then. What has the voter turnout been at these precincts? I didn't bring that. I'm sorry. Has, And I say this because there are some precincts that have very little turnout, even though they may have a larger um, voter pool. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand if just looking at the aggregate number of voters versus actual turnout over time um, is going to um, have more detrimental impact than what is realistically the case. The concern that was shared today is that this, these changes are very close to a presidential primary. And for us to make these changes this close to the presidential primary, it would seem that we should have some actual data that shows that there is a true problem that's existing and not just opportunity that's existing for us making these changes at this point in time, which was shared may be necessary changes, but to me, I'm not hearing that they actually are necessary at this time. Um, yeah, so I, I would, I mean, for me to support this agenda item, I would like to know more than just what is the number of active voters, but what has been the actual voter turnout um, at these sites to know if there's enough of a basis for these change. I'm trying to see if there are any other concerns that were addressed. There's also a question of staffing resources. I know in the past we've talked about early elections and the placement of early election sites and cost has been a driving factor as to why we've limited the number of early voting sites. So I'm wondering also what is the cost of these changes 
to create a set another precinct versus the cost of early voting sites. And what could and should be priority because the actual voter turnout numbers were shared by those who spoke today that spoke about the variation of people who are coming to the main election site during the early, early voting windows and that who actually go to the area early voting site once it opens. To me, those numbers re reflect more of a drive to push for more early voting sites if we have the resources to do so, instead of putting resources towards precinct changes without supporting data for that. So to me, um, I would just like to see those numbers to, to make sure that we're um, putting our monies where the priorities are and, and not just off of um, opportunity, but on, on actuality. Did you want me to, did you have a question? Yes, I mean, I don't think you, I do, but I don't think it could be answered today. I, I, right. Like I said, I need to see data that drives us towards putting money towards this decision today versus putting money towards early voting sites when there's actual data being presented that shows that there is more of a need for more localized early voting sites than there is a need for more precincts. And right now, from looking at this agenda item and listening to you, there is no data that you can provide today that shows beyond the pool of voters, the number, the history of voters that would um, spur this change. Okay, there, there is more than just the cost of the two options. Um, there is logistics of being in a facility for multiple weeks. Um, and being able to schedule a facility for multiple weeks. So that's why there is more difficulty in scheduling uh, the advanced voting locations. We, uh, we plan to increase that, but we have, we have made those schedules for November election. And we're looking at trying to get in for a second week uh, for some of the locations for the March. But that, that was something that we weren't able to schedule. So it's a matter of uh, not necessarily having the money to do it, but the facility being able to accommodate us uh, for multiple days. And the reason, one of the reasons that the large number of voters in a precinct is an issue now is that as we now have an optical scan voting system, a new law uh, well, it's an existing law, but mm -hmm. it was tweaked in the last session, says that you have to have 200 and for every 250 voters in a precinct, you have to have one voting machine. So the larger your precinct is, the more voting machines you have to be able to put in that facility. So there, there is a driver that is separate from how voters turn out. And, you know, whether the lines are long mm -hmm. uh, is maybe preventing people from turning out. I, I don't have that data. Are there any precincts that have a larger number of active voters than these three? There are more. These are the ones that we could get that had a second facility within the precinct boundaries. There are more that we need to split. We have one more opportunity that we could do in the August meeting, but other than that, there is no more opportunities to split precincts due to the time frames for um, being days before the election and the advertising of a notice. Is your next meeting in August for your board? No, our, our board meets monthly, but the only other time based on the election schedule um, for a precinct boundary change, you can't do that more than 60 days prior to an election and you have to notice it in the legal organ 30 days prior to that. So there's a 90 day window for um, doing a precinct boundary change. Okay. Did you advertise this 90 days prior? Yes, we did an advertisement on December 14th. And this would be in the Marietta Daily Journal right. where it was shared? 
Okay. And then for these voters here, you mentioned you would use social media. They are receiving letter notices to be aware of these changes and you would paper their old site so they would know where to go on election day. Right. I must say, I have been in voting locations where people have had to change sites and for some people it is very difficult and was shared, particularly in the Dobbins area, which is a very moderate income location. It can present a significant hardship for persons who don't know. And these, um, um, the communication that we tend to have for the for all is not necessarily the main um, way that everyone communicates. And I've had to learn this through a training I actually went to, a poverty summer training, where it says certain income levels. Paper is the best way for them to communicate, and for others, it's all really word of mouth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more in verbal and in person. And so I'm telling you, I've been at in different polling locations in our district, and I've seen people have to get rides to other locations after they got dropped. I mean, it's very difficult. They've waited in line. They may have children. So, I mean, I don't want to undermine the concerns that are being brought in making these changes even two months ahead of time and, and how we have a, a robust communication about it. Um, so that gives me some concern and I appreciate those that did bring up the concerns because we do this a lot. We just probably have never done it so close to an election before that is causing, um, that is causing this issue. Um, outside of this agenda item, I would like to see how we can have some greater discussion on the early voting sites for the other more localized voting districts mm -hmm. that are, are um, that um, that we have in the county and for today you know I'm hearing that there are other large voter precincts that will have more numbers of active voters than these and there's no data that shows the actual voter turnout. So if we know we're walking into the election in March, there are other large voting districts. There, there is no unique complaint that comes to mind about this site, about people waiting in long, about these three sites and long lines. Um, do we need to do that? Do we need to do this? Well, there, there are um, obviously choices that can be made you could leave it as is and mm -hmm. there would potentially be longer lines at the uh, larger precincts uh, we we do see that you know November obviously is going to be the bigger problem so we're working towards that and we're increasing early voting working towards that and we're uh, trying to split some of these larger precincts we didn't have um, a location right inside the boundary for some of the ones that we wanted to split. Sometimes it's right over the line, and so we didn't have the time in the calendar because of the law requiring certain notification to do those. And as I said, the only other opportunity will be August, which will also prevent or present the same issues being in the middle of an election cycle where people will vote at one location for the presidential primary and the primary, and then another location potentially for November. There's always going sure. to be, and when we do any kind of change, there's always going to be a transition where people are going to have to learn that sure. a precinct or a polling location is never permanent. Sure. And they always, we need to always drive in our communication for people to look themselves up before they go vote because Precincts change all the time. I think that's I think that's a great educational push for us to make sure that that occurs. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I would support you in any effort to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. You did say that each of these of the people in these precincts will get a personalized letter, and they'll also get notification through the precinct card. Um, I would be willing, let me finish. Mm -hmm. I would be willing to have a town hall with you and this uh, joint town hall in, in Dobbins Mill area 
um, I mean Dobbins area for those voters. I can have one in town in the Bells Ferry area, and then y'all can decide if you want to do one in the Smyrna area. I appreciate that. Again, town halls don't always attract. You well, know, I'm just but saying. I, but, but I do appreciate the gesture okay. and us looking at another opportunity for us to work together to communicate. A town hall may not be it, but if there are others who are here that want to help support that effort um, between now and March, um, I think that would be helpful. Okay. But are you call so, questions? yeah. I got a couple of things. Yes. The board of election, dear board, they considered this. This these changes were brought before the board. Correct. And they approved them. Yes. Okay. The second thing is, if I remember correctly, there's something called absentee ballots. Yes. So have you seen an increased use of that medium to get people to vote, to not have to stand in a line? Yes. Okay. And the third thing is, it's I think over the last couple of years, haven't we have to plus up your, your budget to respond to the expenses of adding, to make sure that people, you know, were provided the opportunity to vote in this county? Yes. And have we funded your request to the full? Right. And we have expanded the space at the main office to accommodate more voters there. Um, you know, and, and other things that, that you budgeted for us. Uh, we have uh, new positions that we're using uh, primarily um, for these precinct um, polling location facility evaluations. Uh, one of the issues, for instance, with Dobbins, um, in the last time that we made a boundary change there, is we had a facility that was called Fair Oaks 05 that was not compliant with ADA, and it was due to their parking lot being pretty much gravel, and they would have to repave. So we had to get out of that facility. We have uh, now staff that's able to go searching for new facilities, do ADA compliance, do uh, site diagrams and figure out electrical capacity and, and other things. And so in the case of Dobbins, when we had to close an adjoining precinct, they took on part of that precinct. So the boundary change that was last done in Dobbins was to increase its size. And so, you know, it is now where we, we also have, since 2016, had automatic voter registration through driver services. Uh, in the past, you had to opt in to voter registration. And that law changed in 2016, and you now have to opt out. And so everybody that goes to driver services is registered, which is fantastic. But it has increased our numbers of voters incredibly so we are now at the point like i said where we need to um divide and conquer here's here's a here's a possibility in piggybacking off of commissioner burl's suggestion for for this um again for town hall meetings it it is, requires a lot of logistics for people to make town hall meetings but one thing that we have that we use for when we have meetings is we have our dot signs that we put up and maybe we just put signs in the area in certain places to let people know in advance their polling location has changed. And um, I feel like that would be more direct in the community um, for multiple people to see it who may not come to a meeting. It could provide advance notice so people don't have to wait till voting day to get to a door to see a sign. If we can get some support for doing that, I, I would be more open um, for us making the change. Okay. I think, Mr. Chairman, we need to, um, you know, the Board of Elections is separate from this board for right. a reason. Right. And I think we need to let them do their job. And I think Janine has heard from all of us what our concerns are. They've heard from the public what the concerns are. And um, I think that she understands and can get together with DOT and all those things. I just don't think we need, as a board, to start getting into the minutiae and directing what they need to do. I think all that she needs to know is that the board wants to make sure that the public is properly notified through various different ways, in addition to what you've already proposed. Okay, okay with that, so I hear that. Well, I hear that, but just we are we are the elected body of the people. No matter who we appoint to a board, when the people have a concern, we are the, the elected body of the people to reflect their concerns. So yes, we appreciate we appreciate what goes on, but when we hear concerns from the community that comes up to this board. 
it is if it were to be a rubber stamp it would never come here it comes here because we are always the filter of the concerns of the people we are not supposed okay. to direct the board of elections to make a motion not, to I'm approve not, item number 13. i'm not saying we okay. direct I, all i'm saying is that this is a proper form for us to have these discussions because we always reflect the voice of the people okay Mr. Chairman, with that, I'm, with that I'm going to call the question uh, to authorize the division of Dobbins 01 precinct in order to form the Dobbins 2 precinct. May I have a second? Second. Any okay, discussion? Call the question. Passes 4 to 1 with Commissioner Cuban in opposition. And I'll call the question to authorize the division of Bells Ferry 03 precinct in order to form the Bells, Zero, Bells Ferry 04 precinct. May I have a second? Discussion? Call the question. Passes 4 to 1 with Commissioner Cuban in opposition. And then I call a question to authorize the division of Smyrna 3 Alpha Precinct or to form the Smyrna 3 Bravo Precinct. This discussion? Call the question. Passes 4 to 1 to Commissioner Cupid in opposition. With that, if I could have the board join me down front. We're truly honored today to have Senator Johnny Isaacson with us today. And with that, I'd like to uh, present him with a small little uh, uh, token of our appreciation for all he's done for this county and this country. Chairman. There you go. All right, well, proclamation. Whereas, you don't mind if we call you Johnny today, do you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Johnny Isaacson graduated from the University of Georgia, go dogs, go dogs, in 1966 and served in the Georgia Air National Guard from 1966 to 1972, leaving the rank of Staff Sergeant. He began a successful business career in 1967 when he opened the first Cobb County office of a small family-owned real estate business, Northside Realty, which grew into the largest independent residential real estate brokerage company in the Southeast and one of the largest in America. And whereas, Senator John D. Isaac entered politics in 1974 and served for 17 years in the Georgia legislature in both the House and the Senate. He was elected in 1999 to the U.S. House of Representatives for the first of three terms, and in 2004, he was elected to his first term in the United States Senate. He won re-election in 2010 and 2016. In 2016, he became the first Georgia Republican ever to be elected to a third term in the U.S. Senate. Senator Ising holds the distinction of being the only Georgian ever to have been elected to the State House, the State Senate, the U.S. House, and the U.S. Senate. And whereas, Senator Isaacson served on five key U.S. Senate committees and 116th Congress. He was selected to serve as the chairman of the, U of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, where he focused on improving the quality and timeliness of care of Department of Veterans Affairs health facilities across the country. Senator Isaacson served on the Select Committee on Ethics since 2007, and he was the vice chair of that committee from 2009 to 2014, and served as a chairman in 2000, since 2015. Senator Isaacson also served as a member of the Senate Committee on Finance, Foreign Relations, and Health Education, Labor and Pensions. He worked to shape the foreign policy as well as health care, tax and physical policies to help more Americans succeed. And whereas, Senator Isaacson has always been a friend to Cobb County. In 2016, the roadway commonly known as the Johnson Ferry Bridge was officially named the U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson Bridge in honor of the Senate's distinguished career in public service. The Senator regularly used the bridge as a part of his commute from the Cobb home to his home in Sandy Springs, to his office in Sandy Springs, and whereas Senator Isaacson and his wife Diane 
have been married over 51 years. They have three wonderful children and nine even more incredibly great-grandchildren. <laughs> Senator Isaacson and Diane reside in Marietta in the 10 Mount Zion United Methodist Church, where Senator Isaacson has taught sixth grade Sunday school for over 30 years. Now, therefore, we, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, do hereby, with great appreciation, honor Senator John Isaacson and thank him for his four decades of public dedicated service to Georgia and to this great nation. He is truly a fine example of a true leader, patriot, and a public servant. Signed by all of us, the four members of this Board of Commission, this 14th day of January, 2020. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm not going to speak long because I'm not going to stand up for long. <laughs> but I'm, I'm almost knocked over by your being so nice to me. It's been a pleasure to represent this county for a long, long time since my first race was for county commission in 1974. So 47 years ago, I got started in this business in this county and have been ever since and announced my retirement from the business a few months ago because of my condition with Parkinson's and some other things that I'm dealing with that I really knew I, knew I couldn't be the best job, do the best job I could, so I wanted to quit when I was on top rather than when I was behind. But I knew I didn't quit the people, but I just retired so somebody even better could take my place. So I appreciate all you've done for me, the nice things you've said about me. Wish you all the very best, best of luck. I want to thank Bob and, and Lisa for what they've done. And you're, where's uh, the county manager? Hosack, come over here. I don't mean to talk to you that rough, but you know the people who do these guys will tell you the commissioners, the ladies and gentlemen, the people that do the real work of the county government, are the people that work for the county government, that, that fix the patches and holes, that keep the people in the jail, do all the things counties do, which are not most people don't understand. So I know Rob announced he's going to retire. And I can understand why. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, he's run a great county. He's done a great job. We've been very lucky to have him twice. And if we get real lucky, we might get him for a third time sometime in the future. But congratulations and the best wishes to you. And Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sir. Appreciate the recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Scott. Hi, right, morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. Uh, property Manager's got two items. Our first is the uh, Board of Commissioners approved supple agreement number one with a contract with John W. Spratlin and Son LLC in the amount of $5,979,650 to establish the guaranteed max price of $6,000. $524,927 for the construction manager at risk services to build the replacement fire station number seven located at 850 Hurt Road, Austell, a 2016 SPLOSS program, program X1022 
authorize a procurement through the purchasing department of furniture, fixtures, and equipment not to exceed 550,000 and authorize the corresponding budget transaction and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Pass the five to zero. Uh, thank you. And uh, item 39 is the Board of Commission approved supple agreement number one in the amount of $4,778,632 to the contract with Catamount Con Constructors Incorporated to establish the guaranteed max price in the amount of $5,000,000. $547,390 for the new fleet car service facility, the 2016 SPLOSH program X011. Authorize a corresponding budget transaction and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Um, I'll call that question. Do we have a second? Discussion? Call, call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks sir. Um, Bill, do we have any more for public comment? No, sir, they're not. Okay. So with that, um, we have some announcement, appointments to announce. Commissioner Ott. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to announce the uh, appointment of Mitchell Rivera to the Airport Advisory Board. Um, he is replacing Brian Newsom, who moved um, out of the area. Okay. And I'd like to uh, announce a pleasure the reappointment of Connie Taylor to the Public Library Board of Trustees. And then on the screen, Brad is going to show us the new assignments for uh, the liaison for the commissioners this year. The only thing that's, that should be on there is that communications, uh, Commissioner Gamble has now uh, gracefully accepted that responsibility for the coming year. Okay, with that, for uh, commissioners, I believe we now have uh, Commissioner uh, announcements. Commissioner Cupid, I'll let's start with you. Thank you. Yes, we'd like to encourage the community to come out to our next community zoning meeting on the 22nd. There are a number of matters to discuss, inclusive of a proposed affordable senior development at the intersection of Mableton Parkway and South Gordon Road. There'll also be a follow-up discussion to that meeting at seven with respect to Sanders Road and the crusher operation that is there. Can we just scroll to the next one? Just wanna encourage everyone to celebrate with us you know, for Martin Luther King Day. We will have that back here at Cobb County at our Civic Center. And just a note to the public that our government offices will be closed. Oh, thank you to everyone who came out to the resolution run. Um, we had great weather initially for this day, and um, there was some rain that fell, and it, it fell hard during the run, but it was a nice prelude to what the year may sometimes bring. You start off with great intentions in January, and things happen, and sometimes you just want to stop and, and um, not move forward, but all of our runners completed. And I think that was just a great way of showing how we just need to have fortitude in the upcoming year. Uh, that, that will follow um, sometime later. Um, oh, yes, thank you. Fernando Farr, one of COP's finest. Thank you, um, Commissioner Burrow. Fernando Farr, um, he is with um, COP Police. He came in first for the men. Really? This year, so he certainly deserves um, recognition and applause. Yes, he did an excellent job. Wow. Yeah. He's like in his 40s. He's awesome. Yes. Um, just a note for those of us who like to prepare for our walks and runs on Silver Comet Trail that it will be closed at the Noses Creek Bridge. And finally, um, we have code amendments coming up. We've started to receive com some correspondence, but just encourage the public to look at the Cobb County website to see pending code changes for the upcoming winter. And lastly, thank you to our libraries for participating in Operation Gratitude. And we have the opportunity to express our appreciation to those who serve by um, um, drafting letters and sending them off. Um, towards the latter end of this month. 
The South Cobb Libraries hosting the campaign are listed below at the South Cobb Regional Library, Powder Springs Library, Louis A. Ray Library, and not in District 4, excuse me. Louis A. Ray and Bindings are not in the district, but they're included here as, as the South Cobb Libraries. Okay, with that, I just want to close off with um, some history regarding the Flexbus program, which came up to in today's discussion. Um, Flexbus was never intended to have a per trip cost as fixed route. The reason why we have Flexbus is because we do not have the same numbers of riders to support fixed transportation in some areas of the county where people are dependent on it. But we have um, very high need, but we had no service. And Flex was a a great opportunity, a significant opportunity for persons who lost transit service in 2011 to be able to have access to work, to hospitals, to other various amenities, to supermarkets. We came up with Flex and it was rolled out, large ribbon cutting. Many community members and transportation advocates were there. There was supposed to be a two-year trial of Flex to see what the voter, or excuse me, to see what the rider turnout would be every month because we had to hit certain metrics. Because there was concern about hitting those metrics in the community, we asked for there to be a very robust marketing program that accompanied Flex. The unfortunate matter is the robust marketing efforts never really matched what was needed to get the metrics to where they needed to be. And again, as part of my learning, I keep talking about different communities. They respond to different types of communications. Just having a town hall or putting something in a newsletter doesn't always reach your population. We have, we have three flex areas. Only one of the flex areas has ever met metrics. In talks of tw in 2017 about cuts to transit, there, were, there was interest in cutting transit in the county, including but not solely limited to flex. Then there was conversation that occurred about going to Uber and Lyft. I would have loved to have seen flex maintained and for us to come together as a county to realize we need fixed route service in our community, but that was not part of the discussion. Everybody was in panic mode about thinking that services were going to be cut. So having the opportunity to have Flex, excuse me, replaced by Uber and Lyft seemed like the best compromise to ensure that people can at least continue to have transit service. So my um, advocacy moved from marketing of Flex to supporting Flex and Lyft. What I did learn, unfortunately, is that if we move to Flex and Lyft, it will not provide the door-to-door -door service that we have under Flex today. Flex actually takes us back to where we were pre-Flex because the way that the program has been drafted, it is to take people from where they are to a bus stop. It doesn't take people within the Flex area from door-to-door. And there has not been robust communication to the community about that and that impact. So when I sit here and hear comments that I've asked DOT to expedite that, I'm very concerned. Because the conversations with DOT and I have been for us to make sure that we ensure that there could be door-to-door -door service so that we are not compromising the people who are compromised when we put flex in service or before we put flex in service. And so if there's any move to expedite it, I would like to think I will be a part of that discussion. And I would like to think that we will have a very robust discussion with the community first. I know that flex has an exorbitant cost beyond what it is for fixed transit. And we need to do something and I'm willing to do something, but I'm not willing to do it to the in a matter that will compromise those that we recognize were compromised in the beginning. We've got to do this in a way to ensure success of whatever step that we take and to ensure um, 
the mobility of people that are dependent on that service. Thank you. Commissioner Gamble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this past weekend, Cobb County um, had the privilege of hosting the 50th uh, anniversary of the Georgia Special Olympics. Um, this was the 28th year that Cobb County has hosted this event. Um, special thanks go out to um, Tina Mitchell and her entire therapeutic recreation staff and Mario Henson and the service division who hosted the games for the entire weekend. In addition, Kay Wilson and the Civic Center staff for um, hosting the opening ceremonies. Um, this was my first year attending and it was quite the event. So thank you very much to our Parks Department. Um, save the dates coming up. Um, the next town hall will be February 20th. Um, and this will be at the West, or I'm sorry, the North Cobb Library. We will be doing a town hall on Cobb 911. And then also on February 27th, um, Commissioner Burrell, I believe, will be joining me. Um, we are going to be hosting a um, town hall about voting. And this will be at the North Cobb Library from 6 to 8 p.m. with more details to follow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Burrell. Okay. Um, happy New Year, everyone. First of all, Happy New Year. Um, I'd like to announce that this Thursday, the 16th, we will be, um, DOT and I will be hosting a public information open house on the Campus Loop Big Shanty Chastain Road project um, and improvements. And we will have, um, form, we will have the poster boards for the project. DOT will be on hand to answer questions. And it's Thursday, January 16th from 5 to 7 at Pine Tree Country Club, located at 3400 McCollum Parkway in Kennesaw. You can, um, there will be feedback forms, so we want the public's input. And again, that's Thursday from, six to eight, from 5 to 7 at um, Pine Tree Country Club. Uh, this Saturday, January 18th, Pope High School is having a recycling day to um for proceeds for the band so if you have there is a ten dollar donation but it includes um metal appliances and electronics and you can go to popeband.com recycle to see what is and is not accepted for the recycling and again that's nine to four at pope high school 3001 hembry road in marietta this Saturday. There's several um, events going on throughout the county and the state for um, to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Day. The, as Commissioner Cupid mentioned, the county office will be closed Monday and we are having our um, event at the Jenny T. Anderson Theater this year again. But um, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church on Sandy Plains is um, having a celebration for, of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King at a community-wide multi-church commemorative worship service um, this Sunday, the 19th at three o'clock at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, which is located at 2922 Sandy Plains Road. And we've just completed the project there, um, the DOT project there, so you should be easily getting in and out of the service there. Um, but that would be a great event as well. And then um, we've already announced our, um, our Martin Luther King celebration. Uh, January 21st at 10 o'clock is the next Veterans Connection at the Senior Wellness Center, Powder Spring Street. And you can learn how to navigate the VA website and see what benefits are available for all veterans. Um, there is a number to call to schedule um, to, to RSVP because of uh, seating is limited. And it's 528-1448. 
And on Thursday, the 22nd, we will, I will be having a coffee with your cop at my newest District 3 park, Ebenezer Downs, which is located at um, 4055 Ebenezer Road, right at the intersection of Canton Road. And with this coffee with your cop, we're also going to have the adoption trailer from Cobb Animal Services so that we can um, get some of those dogs and cats adopted out of the shelter. And that is from three, wait, go back. <laughs> Sorry. That's from three to five at Ebenezer Downs, 4055 Ebenezer Road. So come out and have coffee with your cop. Officer Jeg will be there and um, take home your new best friend. And then on January 26, from 5 to 8, I believe that's a Sunday, um, Hook, Line, and Schooner will host a benefit to help the dogs and cats from the shelter. And um, this will be a great, a uh, lot of fun, music, dancing, food. And this will be in Smyrna at the Bronner Hall, 3180 Atlanta Road. You can go to the website, hooklineschooner.com slash benefit to get to purchase tickets. And that's all I have today. Thank you, thank you Commissioner Burrell. Commissioner Rott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, it's hard to believe that this is my 12th year that I've had the honor and privilege to serve the people of District 2. As I reflected back on those years during the holidays, I am also thankful for all the people that have helped me every day. None of this would have been possible without the support of my best friend, my wife, Judy. She, along with Katie and Chris, continued to accept the late nights and weekend phone calls that come with the job. I also need to recognize all the volunteers and appointees who have accepted appointments to numerous commissions and boards. Without them, Kim and I wouldn't be able to serve the citizens of District 2. Many of them are now chairs of their respective groups. Together, we have been able to accomplish so much for our citizens. The challenges started early, and the group showed it was ready and willing to jump right in. In 2009, we had the Great Flood. Less than nine months after starting as the commissioner, the county experienced what experts call the 750-year flood event. Parts of the district were under over 20 feet of water. The Chattahoochee River crested at 29 feet above flood stage. The citizens of the district, especially those along Columns Drive and in Vinings, needed help. The county staff literally came to their rescue. There couldn't have been a worse time, as the county was feeling the effects of the Great Recession. Budget numbers went south. The county instituted furloughs, much to my disappointment. To many county employees, it was a wake-up call that even Cobb County wasn't immune to the devastating impact of the recession. But out of all the down times, we got the commissioners to agree to the creation of the Citizens Oversight Committee. They were tasked to look at all aspects of the county operations and recommend where things could be done a better way. Thank you to all the members of that committee. Although it took some time for all the proposals to work their way into the system, eventually the county started to pull out of the recession. Along with the recovery, there was a new SPOS proposal that for the first time was not the usual six years of questionable spending. With the help of Commissioner Powell, we cut the SPOS to a four-year list of projects, saving over $200 million. During this time of rebuilding, the first of four master plans was approved for the district. The Powers Ferry Master Plan was the first plan created for the county that used citizen groups instead of consultants. With the help of the volunteers and those who attended the town halls, this plan, along with the Johnson Ferry and the Vinings Vision and now the Josh Plan, have all been put in place around the district. As we sit here today, there is yet another master plan that Kim and I are working on with the community to create. I look forward to helping get this new vision for the Oakdale community started. I continue to enjoy the engagement of the community. When I was first elected, no one sent out newsletters or had regular town halls. I remember receiving a newsletter from then Congressman Tom Price and thought it was a great way to talk to the residents in the district. Today, Kim sends out a phenomenal collection of information about things going on in the district, senior events and road projects to name a few. 
Then in the fall of 2013, the district changed forever with the announcement that the Atlanta Braves were moving to Cobb County. Their choice of Cumberland in the heart of District 2 has been an economic engine that has transformed the Cumberland area. The area had not seen a single new Class A office building in over 20 years. But in a very short time, there were five new proposals before the Commission. The transformation has been widely felt. Restaurant Row on Powers Ferry and vacant shopping centers saw new life. The site of the old Brumby School is being redeveloped. Once many of the shops were vacant in the centers around the stadium area, today most are completely full and there are many new restaurants. Some are concerned about the number of apartments in the area. Something that was done differently this time was the restriction on the number of two and three bedroom units. This was to make sure that the area schools, Brumby, East Cobb Middle, and Wheeler were not overcrowded by the new developments. Our success has been seen when the new Brumby and East Cobb Middle School opened under capacity. The Braves will begin their fourth season at the new ballpark, soon to be renamed, actually today. As the new season begins, Thiessen Krupp's new tower is beginning to rise, and the final phase of the battery is nearing completion. These successes will bring more opportunity to the district. I look forward to what the future will bring to the county and the district. So today, I am officially announcing that I will not be running for re-election in November and will be retiring from the commission at the end of the year. I want to thank all the citizens of District 2 for allowing me the honor and privilege of serving as your commissioner. I, for one, will miss you. <laughs> and I say that with all genuineness. So I'm sure there'll be time for accolades later, but we still have a lot of work to do for the rest of the year, Commissioner. All right. um, I do want to follow that, that notice, uh, start out with the good news. Um, I want to thank the uh, first responders who worked during Christmas and New Year's. And for all those uh, for the last uh, weekend when we had the uh, winter spring storm that came through the county last, uh, last Saturday. I've said it once, I'll say it a hundred times, the county employees are the ones that make us all look good and they certainly stepped up to the plate during the holidays and uh, last weekend. Um, we also had a number of county employees who are gonna uh, follow Commissioner Rod into retirement and we wanna wish all of them the best, although uh, Commissioner Rod has to hang around for another year. Uh, we want to uh, offer condolences to uh, our Deputy County Manager, Dr. Jack McMorris. Uh, with deep sadness, we announced the loss of her husband, uh, Wilbert, and the uh, visitation service will be tomorrow here at Mays Ward. And on a, an equally sad note, um, I'll also announce the retirement. Uh, County Manager Rob Hosack has announced his retirement in April. And uh, there's just no words to say how much uh, I'm going to miss him and all these done for his county and I know the employees uh, join me in that and I just want to end with one small story when I was a young captain I uh, got to hear a, a prisoner of war a guy named Jerry Marble tell his story about coming back to America after being in prison in Hanoi for a number of years and they talked he talked about driving up to a to a restaurant uh, you know, facility, probably Burger King or McDonald's or something. And he got out of the car to go inside and order a hamburger. And it took a long time to get the hamburger because the place was packed. So there were a lot of kids in there. So he came back to the car and his wife said, uh, you know, I noticed that while you were standing there and it took a while, you, you were just smiling the whole time. And he said word, he said some words I've never forgotten. He simply said, yes, isn't it great? You know, freedom is different to many different people here, but when I was standing in line uh, last November in, rain, in the rain at my church waiting to vote, I just remembered those words from Colonel Jerry Marble. Isn't it great? Um, voting is our most precious freedom. And I think that uh, we work every day up here at this board to try and provide the resources to um, 
ensure that everybody in this county can vote. And I know we don't all agree on the same approach, but I think in the end, we all want the same thing. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to vote in this county. So I, uh, I stand behind Commissioner Cupid and some of her ideas of how we should do that. And I join her in that. And I'll work to make sure that we can use all avenues approach to make sure that everybody in this county can vote. Because I want everybody, even if you have to stand in line, to just simply say, yeah, isn't it great? So with that, Happy New Year, and we're adjourned.